Love you a lot. Thank you for joining us in Dr. Dave and Herman Bible study. T take a look at the screensaver. Isn't that great? Pray for President Donald Trump. Oh, do that every day. Would you do that? Promise me? Thank you very much. You know, it's a funny thing. I was just asking Brooke, our, my floor director, <laughs> she, if, because I'm different than I did the other show. So, yeah, okay. So just so you know. And uh, have you ever watched the Carbonero effect? Yeah, Carbonero. Carbonero. My, it's one of my wife's favorite program. Uh, it, it's, it's my daughter, so yeah. why not, right? Yeah. So, but what's so funny is the, the people will come on and they've got this, like the guy will have a sh shirt and a necktie on and the woman's talking to him or whatever and he will dip down and come back up and he's got just a shirt or a t-shirt on and the woman and he start he keeps talking to the woman and she doesn't even go the heck you know it's like she she doesn't see what that just happened doesn't even notice that he changed doesn't clothes. even yeah. yeah and the other day I actually did it I mean I didn't do it on purpose but I thought about the carbonara effect because Sharon was cooking breakfast and so she's she's and she had her back to me she's cooking and I had a a shirt different than this but a shirt on and it, it just it felt too warm. So I went real quick into the bedroom and I got a t-shirt on. In fact, the t-shirt that I put on actually has the, it, it, it has the face of Reagan. It's a, it's a Reagan uh, t-shirt. And so I sat down and she, she turned around and she would just continue talking to me with a conversation or what. And I, so I'm sitting there going, Carbonaro effect. I, I changed my whole shirt. And this is, this is a totally different with a, with a man's face on it. And she, so after we, after she said that, I said, did you even see, she, she goes, and then, and then it, it's like, whatever that signal is, it's like, you changed your shirt. Yeah. But isn't that interesting how the brain works? Yeah, yeah. It focuses on what's the most important part, and it focuses on that. And it does that, it, it, I'm sure it does that when you're preaching or teaching, where people, they didn't catch something, the guy next to them go, you didn't get, you didn't hear that? Oh, oftentimes while I'm preaching, things will happen in the auditorium and people ask me afterwards, did I see it, did I notice it? I didn't see it or notice it at all. And it happened right within my line of sight because I'm focused on what I'm doing. The, yeah. the brain picks it all up, but it's so focused on what it's trying to do that it, it doesn't uh, react, but it still retains it. So when it's brought to their attention, the brain can pull it up and go, that's right, I see it now. But at the moment, it doesn't. And Cher was saying the other day, because she, she, I... I, I read the Bible a lot and I study a lot. You probably don't notice it, but I need to do it a lot. And she'll, she'll see me sitting on the couch or whatever, you know, and, she, and I'll be reading the Bible, you know, or, or out on the table or whatever. And she sat down next to me the other, the other day and she goes, I feel like I am illiterate in the Bible. I said, what are you talking Because she's very smart and she knows the Bible. I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, you're always studying. You're always reading the Bible. You're always carrying around. She says, I feel like a piker. I said, honey, I said, I said if I didn't do that, I would be totally a little bit. I said, but I said, I'm not like Dave, meaning you. I said, where he can read something and a total recall. I said, I have to read it, reread it, read it, pick it up again, read it, reread it, read it. But, but that's how she felt just by visually watching what I was doing. But, yeah. you know, we could do that with somebody's life, and it's totally not, you know, the person isn't some Bible scholar. They just got to read it a lot. We all do, whether we're, whether we're academically trained, we have degrees or not. We all should be, it's food. Yeah. We should be eating the Word of this God. This is our owner's on manual, basis. isn't it? It, it instructs us, but it also fuels us. Yeah. It is what gives us the strength to live spiritually. Yeah. And we're going to talk about part two now. I hope you, I hope you saw part one. Uh, we had the same screensaver, okay, on part one. So maybe you think, oh, the, oh, I thought that was part. No, this is part two, okay? And it's talking about God's kingdom. Last week, I, I mean, it, it was fabulous what Dave did, uh, showing this earth is still part of God's kingdom. The kingdom of heaven. God still rules over everything, even if it's in uh, default or it's in defiance or has a prince of the power of the air floating around. It's God still governs everything. Okay, let's go into the first verse. So this is all in Matthew chapter 13. So if you want to open up your Bibles, yeah. 
just turn to Matthew 13 and we're going to talk about the seven different allusions to the kingdom of heaven that are built into Matthew 13 through parables. Yeah. And it's important when it comes to parables that, that you don't want to build theology and doctrine out of parables. Parables are illustrations. Say that again, please. You don't want to build doctrine and theology out of a parable. Parables aren't teaching you a systematic way of looking at things. Parables are stories or anecdotes like a pastor would use in a sermon to illustrate a specific point. Well, there's seven of those in Matthew 13, and they're all famous, and they're often misunderstood. So let's take a look at the first one in Matthew 13, verse 3. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear let him hear. That's a famous parable and Christ actually explains it going on. We'll see in a minute. But many things can be drawn from that. But the main point Christ is, is trying to uh, emphasize is that seed bears fruit and the fruit that it bears is related to in what depth or quality of soil the seed is planted in. It's not necessarily saying which seed is valid and which isn't, which plant is going to heaven and which is not, just that in the reality of gospel truth, the seed goes into soil and how much fruit it bears is dependent upon the quality and depth of the soil. And this is an agricultural community. They understood exactly what he was talking about, that he's talking about the, the life-giving force of faith that it has to have not only good soil and good nutrients, it has to have good roots that go deep for it to last. So he's talking, using that analogy, but he's talking about human beings. He's talking about the, about the need, the illustration is, the need for your heart to have good soil and deep roots to your faith or you will not last. But this is often taken as a way to tell people that you're going to, whether you're going to heaven or not. So the 30, 100, and 60 uh, fruit fold yeah. bearing, that's not a, an expression of how spiritual you are, but the, the depth of the soil that you've been planted in and how far your roots go. And that comes from preparation, just like if you were to be a farmer, you have to prepare the soil for what you're planting. Yes, and that's part of the call of the church to spread the gospel. Part of that call is to keep the soil healthy or else we're throwing seed onto rock. So to make the, the soil healthy, the church has to engage the community, has to engage with the world, has to point out some things that the world doesn't want to have pointed out, has to cultivate, has to remove weeds so that the soil is as healthy as it can be so when the seed hits it, it takes root and grows strong. But it doesn't mean that you have to do something in order to receive Christ. No, no, it, this is just as an illustration that the reason why some plants don't last is the soil isn't good or the thorns destroy it. And the same thing is true of faith. That's the illustration. So in verse 19 through 23, he says, when anyone hears the word of, ki of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what is sown in his heart. Meaning the wicked one? Being Satan. This is he who received by the wayside. So Christ is interpreting his own parable. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. So he interprets his own parable to say this is all about the quality of the soil and the depth of the root, that the seed is going to be received by many people. As the word spreads, people are going to embrace it. But based upon what they are, 
will determine how they respond long term to this truth they gladly receive. I've had people who I've witnessed to who when they hear all their sins can be forgiven, immediately want to say the sinner's prayer and are excited to do it. But two or three weeks later, you can't find them anywhere. And they, they no longer are really interested. It was an emotional response of, boy, that sounds good. But in them, there was no real depth or hunger for the righteousness. There was no desire for, for God. And so that dissipates. Now, the question is, well, then were they really saved? I leave that up to God. I, I don't know. I, I don't think this passage is saying which one of these people are saved or not. It's just talking about the, the tenacity of the persistence of faith is contingent upon the quality of the soil. Well, okay. So, but that analogy can be used for, uh, for example, people say, those people that came forward in a Billy Graham crusade. Uh, many of those just go out and do what they were doing before. They walk forward and really, okay. It, would that analogy fit? It would fit the analogy of that that is the way of the nature of the seed. The seed hits ground, it, it, it reacts. Like you say, they were sighted to hear that invitation, that music, just as I am. They came forward yeah, as an, an emotional and, and some don't come forward at all because their heart's rocky. And the, the seed hits and the evil one snatches it away. Some hit in thorny ground. Some hits in shallow ground. And it pops up. And the response is genuine. This response is sincere. I don't think this parable is about which one of those are really going to heaven. It's just he's explaining the nature of human response to the Word of God so that the disciples will be prepared. Well, for is it... Is it, 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 it tells you which one actually received personally the message of Christ. Well, all of those did. See, some of them receive it with joy and it doesn't last. So all of these re receive it. But the, the, so you got to understand what is the message of the parable and not... What is the message? That the Word of God is going to have a response from people and people are going to respond differently based upon the depth of their, uh, of the soil of their heart. And some might have an immediate re positive response, but it won't last a short time. Some are going to embrace it completely. The root's going to go deep and they're going to have great fruit. But he, did, he, he doesn't say then, and those that don't are going to hell. Okay. But he does it later on. Yeah. In the next parables, he does specify that, but not Again, in Again, it just reinforces that Christ is the one that brings the increase. Yes, and that's why he says some are going to be 100, some 30, some 60. It's not the plant. Yeah. It's the, the length of life is based upon the root and the soil, but the fruitfulness is determined arbitrarily by God. Boy, if you had 12 theologians sitting with you discussing this, you'd probably have a lot of arguments. You might have 14 different viewpoints out of 12 guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but and that's, we have to be careful. When, you, when you, an illustration falls apart, the more you apply it to something, parables are illustrations. That's exactly right. And we have to keep that in mind. So look at verse 24. The kingdom of heaven, this is a new one, is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now remember, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Yes. And here's wheat and tares in it. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? He said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that, you, that I read this verse is because when I first started in television, back in the 80s and into the 90s and so forth, I felt that I had a duty to try to protect all these people out there that were getting bad messages. You know, because there's a lot of it on Christian television. I mean, it's like, you know, you, you better know what, what they're saying or you could be caught into some weird theology. So it was almost like it was my duty so I had all these different interviews of people trying to trying to save all these and I'm not kidding you I was doing my exercise uh, I think we lived in I know we lived in Clearwater then and I was jogging to the to the beach from Clearwater about uh, 10 miles round trip and it was like the Holy Spirit said 
Herman, that is not your job. This first came to mind. Mm -hmm. I will take care of the terrors. What you're trying to do is protect them about against the terrors. I take care of that. And that's the point of that parable. He's letting the disciples know as this thing unfolds, and he hasn't told them yet, but when I'm gone and this kingdom is growing, you're going to have the tendency to want to police what's in the field. Yeah. You're going to want to get rid of tares. And as you're doing it, you're going to be destroying the fragile faith of the wheat. Right. And so he's warning them, don't do it. Yeah. Just take care of the wheat. Let the tares grow up. I'll divide it later on. You don't have to identify and pinpoint everybody who's not a believer because you can't tell. Yeah. At a certain point in their growth, the wheat and the tares are identical. Yeah. As long as they get to a certain point of, uh, of fruition yeah. where you can separate the wheat from the tares. Yeah. And that takes time. Every, every once in a while, I will find myself drifting back into that. And it's just like the Holy Spirit said, remember the 90s, Herman? And it's like, a, and, I, and this is the verse that comes up to me. Well, you know, I'm, I'm uh, in my mind, I'm getting old now, you know, in the 60s. <laughs> yeah. When I was in my uh, 30s, maybe even 40s, yeah. you know, th th those kind of distinctions were very important to me. And I wanted to point out the right and the wrong of stuff all the time. And there were, there were people who just always wanted to debate and argue yeah. the little intricacies of spiritual truth. But if you realize that the ways of God are higher than our ways, His thoughts are not even our thoughts. God functions and does things in ways we can't fully comprehend. Why are we arguing over the minutia of it yeah. rather than enjoying the fellowship we have in faith? We both say we believe in Jesus. Let's love one another, preach the gospel, and God can tell everybody who's right or wrong later on but I don't know if that's a process of age, uh, yeah, a mellowing, yeah, yeah. or if it's a process of spiritual maturity, but I don't have any uh, desire, interest in arguing, yeah. debating, well, you, any of these I, issues I, with anybody. I think it's the maturity, uh, you know, spiritual maturity, because, because I, I was in my mid-40s when that was going on, and uh, I'm going to try to protect all these people and get this bad, bad, bad information. And, uh, and then you realize that you are not <laughs> called to do that. You're God not, takes not, care of that. And you're not even equipped because you can't tell. You can't see into the heart of anybody. Yeah. And so those who want to try to classify whether or not Donald Trump is saved or not, you can't tell. That's right. Only God knows. That's right. That's right. And, it, and whether or not he's saved or not, it obviously has no bearing on, on the fact that God's using him. So that's what we rejoice in. Hey, God's using the man. He uses let's, whoever let's he wants God to. God use who he wants to use. Yeah, <laughs> right. He hasn't chosen to use me. He didn't make me president. Yeah. So, Here's the man he put yeah. president. What does that say? But, but you're, you're doing, uh, I remember Billy Graham, they wanted him to go into politics, and he said, I would have to step down and do something lesser than what I'm doing now. Uh, and not because preaching is better than being a politician, but it's because that's what God wants you to do. Exactly. If God wants you to be a politician, don't step down and be a preacher. Exactly. If God wants you to be an athlete, don't step yeah. down and be a preacher. You, you do whatever God wants you to do. Now, in verse 37 through 42, I'm not going to read it, but Christ explains that parable, and he is talking about salvation here. He says, I am the one who sows the seed. Satan is the one who comes and sows the tares. Yeah. And I will at the end time have them burned. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that parable is about those who are saved and not saved. Okay. But his point is, don't you mess with it. Yes. I'll take care. Yeah. So now we come to verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and they gathered the good, talking about fish, into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's where we get the teaching that hell is a burning flame and you, and you never die. Yes, and in a number of Christ's teachings, he references hell in very pictorial, graphic terminology. Whether or not it's literal or not, the truth is literal. That it's a painful, horrible place you don't want to go and you can never get out. That's the truth. He used fire as the image for us to grasp that that's how bad it is. So you can argue whether or not it's really fire or not. And what kind of dimensional fire is it? If it's burn up spirits, how can it be a physical fire? That's not the point. It's the anguish of fire is what he's emphasizing. And that's literal. The anguish is literal. So um, those who want to argue about that, it's, it's really a, it's a missing the point of the message. But here he's talking about the fish again. God throws out the net. We bring it in. We can't tell until it's all brought to the shore 
how good the catch is. God will take care of that. Angels will come and separate. There's the, there's the part that we get me messed up is that we, we somehow think we are part of this checking out. Yes. You know, de determining who is. Yeah. And we get caught up in that. And boy, does Satan love that. I saw a funny joke. It's an old joke uh, the other day that it was about a, um, a man who was on a bridge. He was going to jump. He was depressed. And a man came to help him. And he said, hey, buddy, why are you jumping? He says, well, my life is miserable. He goes, well, do you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. I'm a Baptist. Well, I'm a Baptist. He goes, what kind of Baptist are you? I'm a Northern something Baptist. Oh, I'm a Northern something Baptist. And they went down the list till they got down to the Northern something Baptist of the certain region of the certain this. And then they both were that. And he goes, well, what, 1899 or 1912? 1912, heretic, and he pushed him. <laughs> so we, we get so focused on the little things that we believe that we separate ourselves from other believers, yeah. and we not only separate, we judge them as if they're not as good as us because they're not right in our little camp. That, that's a dangerous, life-sucking uh, trait that ruins the true fellowship of the Spirit. My awakening, uh, Dave, when I was arrested for... Uh, uh, standing in front of an abortion clinic, you know, and they, they handcuffed me and took me away. Steve, my son, also with us, and threw us in jail, fingerprinted us, the whole thing. And I'm sitting there in this big holding pen, and I'm sitting next to a person, and boy, he's just rejoicing in the Lord and talking about, you know, boy, I tell you, that, you know, to, to be persecuted trying to save lives, there's nothing better. He said, I just I rejoice. So I'm thinking, this is years ago, I'm thinking, must be a Baptist, must be you know, Assembly of God or somebody I'm sitting next to. I said, let me ask you, where, where do you go to church? He goes to Catholic Church. <laughs> Saint yeah. so-and-so, Saint Michael's or something like that. And it was like the Holy Spirit said, do you get it? Okay? Don't, just like you just did with that, with that joke. Yeah. You can pinpoint, this must be saved, this must be, oh, you go to Catholic, oh man, wow. We're on different planes. No, the guy could be a lover of Christ. Well, think of the encouraging thing to me is the thief on the cross. We don't know his theological background, his understanding, what he thought about Jesus, other than he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He went to heaven. Yes. He might not fit into any of our theological He wasn't camps. baptized. He, wasn't, he, didn't, he wasn't doing a lot of things, <laughs> but he got to go. Yeah. So we, we, need to, that, we need to step back sometimes yeah. with our human restrictions of who's a true believer and leave that up to the Lord. Keep going. Uh, verse 31 through 32. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. And that's just an illustration of it's, uh, it's, unno it's an unnoticeable and significant seed, but it has a great product that the kingdom of heaven is often unnoticed. It's insignificant in the of the world, but in the in the reality of things, it grows into a beautiful bush that can harvest and and house uh, things. It's a it's a reminder to them that don't you know judge a book by its cover. The kingdom of heaven is is tiny; you can, you can almost miss it. It's like that seed, wow. but it will grow and it will grow great. Wow. Verse thirty three: The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three meals of meal till it was all leavened. And that's an illustration of the, uh, the, the spreading nature of true spiritual life. It spreads. It's contagious. It will, it will affect its environment. Uh, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. What an analogy. And the next one he has is very similar, and they're both famous. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Those last two parables are not saying that we can buy eternal life, that we can work our way up to receive eternal life. He, it's simply an emphasis of value, that eternal life, faith is so valuable. If you could buy it, it would be worth you selling everything you have to get it. That's how important this thing is. And that's a reminder to the disciples because after he's gone, life is going to come in hard and fast. Persecution is going to be intense. They're all going to lose their own lives. They're all going to come to that point in their life of faith that they've got to make a decision. Do I want to hold on to this thing that I really can't see the evidence of? I sense it. I feel it. 
but Rome is certainly stronger than me. Uh, persecution is taking my, my wife, my children, my family, my friends. We're not surviving. So why am I holding on to this thing? Why am I risking everything for this thing I can't really see? He's uh, letting them know the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price that you would sell everything and get it if you knew you could get it. Or it's like a treasure you found in a field and you'd hide it and then go buy the field so you could have the treasure. That's how valuable this thing was to the point that you would be willing to lose everything because you really can't lose anything when you have eternal life. So those last two parables aren't telling us how we can acquire heaven and the effort it takes to get it, but just how valuable it is that it would be worth everything. It's what that lawyer who came to Christ, the rich man, and wanted to know, what do I have to go to do to be, go to heaven? And Jesus said, well, sell everything you have. He wasn't telling the man, this is the way you can go to heaven by selling everything you have and giving it to the poor. He was telling the man, you don't really want it. And I'll show you why you don't really want it. You want that more. You're not willing to sell everything you have. Because if your real desire is to go to heaven for all of eternity, and you can do it by selling everything you have, that is the bargain basement deal of a lifetime, but not if you really love your stuff instead of God. So when you hear Christ give illustrations and exhortations, keep in mind, he, he is the one who secures our eternal life. He's the one who paid the price. It is free to us. It is the most valuable thing you and I will ever, ever possess. And for us to have that, to keep on our minds so we don't let go of it in terms of our faith, that we don't get distracted by what the world comes up to offer, that when the thorns come up and choke, we don't pass out. When Satan comes and tries to take it away, we don't succumb to the temptation because we know what we have is the most valuable thing in all the universe, eternal life, forgiveness, and reconciliation with God. The parables of Christ are beautiful illustrations of powerful truths that the gospel is the greatest truth in all the universe. It's the greatest treasure. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, don't let anybody try to talk you out of it. Don't exchange it for anything. And don't think you've been cheated because you've lost your health or you've lost your job or your family doesn't love you or you're all alone. You haven't lost anything. That's why Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Understand the power of what you believe. And it's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's free. It's free. All you have to do is ask. Jesus Christ, invite him in. Be my personal Lord and Savior. Because he is personal. Trust him today. God bless you.